Well, let's go ahead and be seated as we uh, get started with the children's sermon. Look like you guys are nice and seated here this morning. I want to read you guys a quick story. There was a story in the Bible where Jesus, now of course Jesus is known as a healer, right? I mean, that's one of the things that he did. He did a lot of things. He was a teacher, uh, he was a healer, and of course he's our Savior. Mm -hmm. But there's one instance in which he was a healer that he was actually teaching in a house. Okay, and this is what happens. It says, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there, and there was no room left, and not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing him a paralytic. Okay, what do you know what a paralytic is? A paralytic is somebody that can't move. Okay, they can't work their their arms or their feet or their hands or anything like that. They're paralyzed. And so they carry. He was carried by four men. And since they could not get to him to get him to Jesus because of the crowd. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus. After digging through it, lowered a mat the paralyzed man was on. So, if you can picture this, Jesus was in the middle of the room. There's too many people around him. People can't get through to him. So they get on the roof, okay? I think the roof of your house. And they dug a hole through the roof. Do you think any, any one of you would do that? No. Okay, he's claiming it. But... Uh, Whoever this kid belongs to, watch your roof. I'm just saying. Okay. I'm giving him ideas. Um, well, they dug a hole through the roof. Now, I'm not saying it was right. Okay, I'm not saying it was wrong. But they wanted to get to Jesus. They did everything they could to get to Jesus, and they lowered him down. And you know what happened? So when Jesus saw his faith, he said to the par- paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And later he said to the paralytic, To get up, take your mat, and walk. Now, this story shows two things. This shows the power of Jesus to heal people. But what this also shows is that sometimes people will stop at nothing to get to Jesus. Now, for us, it's coming to church or, or, or saying a prayer at night or anything like that. But there's some people in some places and countries in the world where they can't do that. It's illegal. Yeah. There's some places like some parts of the Mideast East where their leaders say that it's, a, it's, it's wrong for them to say a prayer to Jesus. No. Well, you know what? He might be the president of the United States, but he can't tell what other, happens in other countries. And so there are other countries where if somebody's caught praying to Jesus, they, uh, they'll get jailed, they'll get beaten up, some of them even get killed. And so sometimes there are, there are people that will stop at nothing to get to Jesus. Now, I want to ask you guys to get to Jesus, to get to Jesus to help your family, to help you and everything like that. What would you do? You know, do you pray every day? Do you pray to Jesus? Do you pray to God? Well, that's a good start. Okay? And you can thank the Lord that we live in a place where we can do that. Okay? But just like those men who stopped at nothing to get to him, I want you guys to do as much as you can to be with him. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for these kids. I want to thank you for them and, and just them being here today. And Lord, as they, as they learn their lessons today, I pray that you will be with their teachers as well as them. Thank you, Father, for their, uh, their presence here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We now come to our time of offering, and I want to, before I give my prayer, I want to tell you that a lot of times there are many, many people out there that say, you know, pastors and churches, they just ask for money all the time. And though we do take an offering every Sunday, I think we need to kind of rethink us needing to give. And here's the thing that you need to understand. You see, we as servants of God, we read in the Bible that the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, money itself is not the root of all evil. Money itself is neutral. Okay, it's only as evil as the person that uses it. And so money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, this is what offering does. It keeps you from loving your money. I mean, by giving, what you do is you give it to a cause that you know, that you trust, that you believe And what that's doing is that is removing that love of money. 
that develops the root of evil. So keeping that in mind, that is what the offering is. It's a time for you to give away that which can get a hold of you. Because trust me, God owns, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He really doesn't need your money to do his job. But what you need to do is you need to give in order to alleviate that love for, what you, for those things that you have in your life that you should not love. And that is money, of course. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for uh, the ability to earn a wage, the ability to have this time to give. And Father God, as we do give, I pray that we will be giving because we love you, because we want to see what, you can, what can be done in your kingdom. Lord God, not because we feel compelled to or, or that we feel um, obligated or that we're guilty or that we think we'll get something in return, Father. It's, it's not about that. It's giving because we love you. It's giving because we don't want to love money. We want to love you. So, Father God, I just pray that this is the motivation and that we can do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah, well, once again, good morning, everyone. We're going to read together in the book of Daniel. That's where we're going to be today, is in the book of Daniel. And we're going to kind of use this as a launch pad for this sermon today. It's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And you can read it up there, as well as reading it in your own Bible. It says this, it says, In my vision... At night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now I can think... I think that we can all agree that there are some things that are not as they seem from first glance. Aside from the obvious that we had Lariva come up here and <laughs> dressed like that, that uh, she was not what she seemed at first glance. Now here's some other examples of this. A lead pencil contains no lead. It actually contains graphite. A silkworm is not a worm. It's a caterpillar. A cucumber is not a vegetable, it is a fruit. A Mexican jumping bean is not a bean, it is a seed with a larva inside of it. And a uh, banana tree is not an actual tree, it is actually a giant herb. And, and if you don't believe me, you can fact check me on that. Um, I got it for all from Google, so, you know... <laughs> There, one picture does come to mind of something like this, and that's of an iceberg. It's a giant piece of floating ice that can be many stories tall above the surface, but the true size of an iceberg lies underneath the surface, where it's said that 90% of the mass and volume of that iceberg is set. Now, we can only imagine how truly large the iceberg was that sank the Titanic, right? Now, the world is filled with these types of mysteries, those paradoxes that cause us to take a, a sound look at the truth behind something. Now, spiritually speaking, we ourselves kind of fall into that category. Being living, breathing human beings, some of us could be called living in death if we're living apart from Christ, while others who have Him as their Lord and Savior have a greater life that is sealed away for them in heaven. Now, these hidden mysteries become a reoccurring theme in scriptures, one that is talked about in 1 Timothy 3.16. Listen to this. It says, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godly, godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on the world, and was taken up in glory. This is the mystery that we're going to kind of look at today. What does Jesus, one who was not only fully man, but also fully God, have to do with our salvation? Why was it so important to come down 
and live for us, only later to die for our sins three years later after his ministry started. And when he rose from the dead, why was it significant that he went back up into heaven? Now this is all part of what is called the grand mystery of the gospel, which is something that people still battle with today. Now believe it or not, the answer to this mystery actually lies in a title that Jesus gave himself through the scriptures, and that is the Son of Man. That title, the Son of Man. Understanding the use of this title in scriptures will give one a clearer picture of who, what Christ actually did for us while he was here on earth, who he was, and what he continues to do to this very day. So here's the first point here. That the Son of Man was fulfilled prophecy. Now, I don't want you to make a mistake into thinking that Jesus just threw this title out in the midst of, uh, of people because it was a popular thing to do. Okay? There are several places in the Old Testament where this term is used, but the key passage that stuck out in the minds of the people and the teachers of that day was the passage in Daniel. It is out of that theme passage for, for today that is the prophecy that is very particular to one person, and that is the Messiah. Have you ever heard somebody say, name it and claim it? You ever heard that before? Now, I'm not talking about the, how it's used in Christian circles. That's completely different. But, but rather in daily life. Name it and claim it. Okay, so say you, uh, you walk into a group of Eagles fans wearing a Patriots jersey. Okay. Yeah, right, right. I suppose you could deny it. You could say, hey, this isn't my Patriots jersey. This is a high school letterman's jacket or something like that. But lying about it wouldn't help the situation. But if you go in there and you say, yeah, this is a Patriots jersey and I'm a fan of the team and I hope they win the Super Bowl. Well, you just named it and claimed it, brother. You named it and claimed it and you had better be ready to run. That is what Jesus does when he uses the term Son of Man. Now listen to his use of it in Mark 2, 8 through 12. After he heals the paralytic, was lowering through the, the roof by his four friends, like I gave for the children's sermon. Listen to what he says to the Pharisees that saw this happen. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is one of the first times that Jesus uses the phrase to, pro, to replace the personal pronoun I. Okay? Instead of saying I have the authority to forgive sins, he says that the Son of Man does. Now this would have raised some red flags with the Pharisees who were listening because they would have known exactly, exactly where that came from. There, this was, there was only one key place where that phrase could have come from, and it was that passage of Daniel. And so that means that Jesus was claiming to be the prophesied individual who would have all authority, all glory, all honor, all power, and be worshipped among the nations. Jesus can be considered bold, right? He can be considered bold. But I like to also think that he was strategic. By challenging the Pharisees with this use of the name, he was setting up the events that would eventually unfold into his death. But we'll get to that in a minute. Here's the second point. The Son of Man was an actual man. He was an actual man. Now, when I went to a Bible college, it was common for us to get bored around campus, right? I mean, you've been to college before. You know what it's like. So to pass the time, many of us would concoct some incredibly brilliant, if not diabolical pranks, to, pray, to play on our other dorm mates. 
One particular pr pr prank included the use of caramel apples that were left in places for people to snatch them up. Now, if you know anything about dormitories, you know the whole idea is that anything that's left out is pretty much available for anybody. I mean, pizza itself had like a week or two week shelf life. It was just left out on the table. So, of course, these caramel apples that we put out there, they weren't actual caramel apples. They weren't really apples at all. <clears throat> they were onions on a stick with caramel over them. Now, this has been used on the internet before. We were the ones that thought that up. This is, we're, we're, we're the ones here. The beauty of this prank is that in order to actually get to the good stuff, you have to bite into the caramel. And if you bite into the caramel, you're also getting some onion, too. So let's just put it that uh, they were a very popular item for a little while, but then nobody wanted to come back and finish the job. Now it's easy to say that Jesus is the Son of God because His divinity is very evident in everything that He does. He healed the sick, He cast out demons, He manifested food out of very little, and He even rose from the dead. But He was not a fake man like that onion was a fake apple. He was actually fully man as well as being fully God. The evidence of Jesus' humanity is quite obvious in scriptures. In Luke 2.7, it says that he was born as a, as a baby. In Luke 2.40, it says that he grew up into adulthood. In John 4, 6, it says that Jesus could become tired. And in John 19.28, it says that he could also get thirsty. And during his temptation in the wilderness, Jesus became hungry. So all of these are evidence of something that is commonly called the incarnation. Now this doctrine, the doctrine of incarnation means that God stepped down. Okay, He stepped down from eternity through time and space and placed himself into this temporal world as a man. This can be best seen... In a very highlightable verse, okay, this is a term I use every time I say this, a highlightable verse. If you want to, you can highlight in your Bible this verse. This is huge. This is John 1.14. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Do we completely understand this? Mm, it's hard to. It's hard to wrap our finite minds around something so infinite as what we just read. But it's a very important part of understanding this mystery of the Son of Man. Because if Jesus was not both fully man and fully God, then His actions as our intercessor would not work. They would not work. You see, there are rules in place with God, and that's called the law. According to the law, blood has to be paid for sin. And it could not be God directly as God eternal because God is eternal. He can't die. And so what did He do? It had to be a life. And so He came in as Jesus. And Jesus, being human, could be that life. So without a true Son of Man, the sacrifice would mean nothing. Now, Apart with this sacrifice, with this sacrifice, there are two aspects that are defined as his, his, as his uh, title as Son of Man. Because he was first a servant and then he had to die a physical death. So let's look at that. The Son of Man was a servant. In the history of modern warfare, there's always been those who are willing to pick up a weapon and defend their country from their enemies. Many of these are infantry, artillery, even pilots. But there's one group within the military that chooses to fight on a different level during combat. And those are the military field medics. These are a group of trained men and women who join the battlefield with the soldiers and give them first aid and moderate trauma care during and after firefights. When the first Geneva Convention was adopted in 1864, field medics were granted the title of non-combatants and were given protection by the convention. So if an enemy soldier were to intentionally fire upon someone wearing the insignia of a medic, which was usually a cross, that could be seen as a war crime. 
Medics, however, were equipped with a standard sidearm, which they could use to protect themselves or the person who they were helping. But by doing so, they would forfeit their protection under the convention. Now, Jesus did not come as a combatant, as many believed that he would, but rather he came as a servant. He spells that out in Luke 19, 9 through 10, when he was talking with Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Now the world is in the middle of and has been in the middle of a battle that has been raging against good and evil ever since the birth of humanity, maybe even longer. The devil and his forces hate everything that God has created and will do everything they can to destroy the hope that God has instilled in His people through His Son. God's forces, on the other hand, war against the devil and his minions by toppling over false doctrines and defending those who have been sealed away by the Holy Spirit. During the height of this war, Jesus came down and did not offer a military solution to the problem, but rather brought a spiritual revival where death only reigned. Notice that he did not draw a sword to kill those opposing him, but instead he humbled himself as a servant before his people. Jesus knew that many people were not seeing the Son of Man as a servant. So near the end of his life, he did something that only a servant would do. He washed his disciples' feet. This act would have been truly eye-opening, seeing as... For the culture of the day, foot washing was usually reserved for the servants of the household and not the masters. Jesus had a twofold position. He was both a servant and a master. Listen to what's said in John 13, 12 through 17. It says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, Jesus did all of this as the Son of Man to lead an example to His disciples, to us, that no servant is greater than His Master. We as children of God have been inducted into the service of the kingdom. And as such, we are servants of Christ and must humble ourselves and serve others as He did. Now, of course, this also pointed toward the ritual cleansing of what would become within the next few days, what he would become within the next few days, and that is a sacrifice. And that brings us to our fourth point here, that the Son of Man had to die. The death of Christ is one of the biggest mysteries in this puzzle. Because Jesus Christ surely had the power to prevent it from happening. Some theologians believe that Jesus did not have the power to stop his death from happening, but I don't personally think that's true. I think it's a greater testimony to Christ's love for His people that He allowed it to happen to Him. You see, the Son of Man, being a man, could die. And that death would have been enough to atone for the sins of all mankind for several reasons, and we'll have them up here. First off, Jesus was perfect. The Old Covenant required a spotless lamb for the atoning sacrifice of the people, as seen in Exodus, where a pure lamb was given and the Passover. Now that brings us to our second point. Jesus had to give all of his blood. All of it. Because of the sins of the people, the sacrifice had to be drained of its life. And blood equals life. Jesus did give all of his blood as seen in his crucifixion when a soldier pierced his side and the water was separated from the blood in John 19.34. Physicians have looked at this passage and said, that's what happens when a person loses all of their blood. 
Now this was necessary to meet the demands as payment for sin. Third, Jesus had to die an actual death. No, Jesus did not pass out and spend three days in an airtight tomb wrapped in over 70 pounds of burial cloth only to remove those, roll a nearly two-ton boulder away from the entrance, and walk out in his weakened state. No, Jesus was dead. He was as dead as any sacrifice that came before him. But that brings us to our final point. In order for this to actually work in our favor, he had to rise again. This is the kicker. It was one thing to sacrifice a perfect individual that would have atoned for the sins, but eternal life would not have come if Jesus didn't rise again. You see, in order for us to have eternal life like Jesus, he would have to rise again from the grave, already having been sacrificed for our sins. Since our eternal destiny was bound to that sacrifice, it's bound to the sacrifice, it's also bound to that resurrection. That is the fullness of the gospel message. Look at the last point here. Put it right up there. It should be right down there at the very bottom. Oh, they haven't switched it over yet. Okay. Oh. Go ahead, and, go ahead and go through that real quick because there's a, there's a point right there. Yeah, well, it's up there. Um, yeah, cycle through it a few more times. And there you are right there. That one right there. Our lives are bound to the sacrifice plus the sacrifice comes back to life equals we can have life after death. There it is. There's your formula right there. That's how it works. You see, the Son of Man was fully God and fully man. And He's still alive today. And that brings us to our next slide. <laughs> he is risen! It brings us to our next slide. Yes! Absolutely. Because He went back up to, he back up to be in heaven with God. We can look forward to that knowing that this Son of Man gave His very human life over for those who would either accept Him or reject Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank You for the Son of Man. Coming down as a man, being the example for us, Lord God, in the way that He lived, in the way that He walked, talked, He taught, the way that He healed, all of that, Father. God, we can... We thank you so much for this. And Lord God, if there is anyone out there, Father, that it is on their conscience that they have not accepted your Son as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that they will do that, Lord. Lord God, we thank you so much for coming down as a man and being that Son of Man for us. Amen. Amen.